2 Corinthians. Okay, and uh, let me give you a little background where we are, and then I'll pick back up where I left off. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lays some groundwork for the boasting in which he's about to engage, and it pains him to speak this way about himself. You can see this in what we'll read now. You'll see it again and again. It just kills him to have to promote himself in any way. But he feels compelled to do it because of his love for the Corinthians. Because the Corinthians, in their immaturity, they are, they are in their spiritual immaturity, they're gauging Christian leadership by worldly criteria. Paul feels compelled to do some kind of counter-boasting or you know, making his case to counter what is being done by these Judaizing intruders, these false apostles who are coming here, and they are constantly boasting about themselves uh, under their worldly criteria, and they're having an effect, so there's a danger, they're luring the Corinthians away, so Paul feels compelled that he has to make a case for himself, and it's killing him to do it. But uh, he's going to do it because his love for the Corinthians compels him to do that. In chapter 11, verse 16, through the first part of verse 21, he gives the final preface to his foolish boasting. And he chides the Corinthians in verse 19, saying, For you gladly put up with fools being wise yourselves. See, they viewed themselves. Uh, they thought, you know, they were really in the know, knowledgeable. They were wise. They saw themselves as wise, but the result of their great wisdom was that they tolerated fools. You see, that's, that's what wound up from, that's what ended up from their great wisdom. In other words, they had a warped wisdom, a worldly wisdom that kept them from recognizing fools, from recognizing false apostles, from recognizing that these Judaizing intruders who are promoting themselves and saying they're the real deal and they're God's man, and they're falling for all that. So true wisdom would have discerned, no, no. You see, so he chides them there and says, you know, you you gladly put up with fools being wise yourselves. In fact, their brand of wisdom, they not only tolerated false apostles, but apparently they granted them positions of influence and leadership. So it wasn't that they simply, they, they let them in, gave them positions of influence and leadership, and the intruders had become tyrants. They were intimidating, abusing, and exploiting the Corinthians, the Corinthian congregation. So that's how they're, you know, how, how they're trained. They're just, you know, s- steamrolling them. So they have this, they adopt this worldly criteria. They by that elevate these people, say that they're the real deal, bring them in and not only tolerate them, give them influence and leadership. And then these guys turn around and abuse and exploit the Corinthians. And that's, uh, you know, so, so they had accepted that triumphalist criteria of apostolic authenticity and leadership and were in turn they were in turn were trampled by these people. Well Paul in no way wants to be compared with these power hungry exploiters. He doesn't want to be compared with them. He says in verse 21 that they admittedly they were too weak for that kind of conduct to come in and slap you around and steamroll you and boss you around and crush you. They were too we were quote too weak to do that kind of thing. Paul and his companions conducted themselves with the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, and the Corinthians dismissed them as what? Unimpressive and weak. You see, that's how they... So here they are in the meekness and gentleness of Christ as opposed to these false people who are coming in, bossing, powering, exploiting, abusing, and they're just, wow, that's really something. They come in in the gentleness and meekness of Christ, and these people say, look, they're unimpressive. They're weak. They don't have the power, the status that you'd expect from Christ man. On the other hand, they they kowtow to these people, to their aggressiveness, their abuse of authority that's being exercised by servants of Satan who are what? Masquerading as apostles. And they're kowtowing to that. So you can see the situation. So Paul now, he begins his his own boasting, his counter, and it's very interesting. He says in chapter 11, verse 21, second part through verse 33, he says, but in whatever respect someone dares to boast, I'm speaking in foolishness, I also dare. Are they Hebrews? I also am. Are they Israelites? I also am. Are they Abraham's seed? I also am. Are they servants of Christ? I am speaking as being out of my mind. I am more of one. With more labors, 
more imprisonments, beatings beyond measure, and frequent deaths. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the deep. On many journeys, I was in dangers from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from my people, in dangers from Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the country, in dangers at sea, in dangers among false brothers. I have lived with labor and toil, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, many fastings, cold and nakedness. Apart from the additional things, there is the daily pressure on me, my worry over all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn. If it is necessary to boast, I will boast about the things that concern my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the ethnarch of King Aretas was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me, and I was lowered in a basket through a window through the wall and escaped his hands. Okay, Paul says here, he begins his boasting with a declaration that he is in no way inferior to any conceivable rival. Whatever they can boast about, he can also. Okay, when he says here, but in whatever respect someone dares to boast, I also dare. Whatever, he, he is not inferior to any conceivable rival, but it's so painful for him, he again adds, I am speaking in foolishness. And then referring to the false apostles, Paul writes, are they Hebrews? I also am. Are they Israelites? I also am. Are they Abraham's descendants? I also am. You see, what Paul's doing here, he wants to make it clear from the start that when it comes to Jewishness, he takes a back seat to nobody. Okay, when it comes to Jewishness, he takes a back seat to nobody. His opponents can gain no spiritual edge over him by appealing to their pedigree as the Old Testament people of God. You could see how that would work, right? I mean, in a Gentile church, here come the, well, we are Jews, you see. And Christianity comes out of, so we have the special up on you. You see, so this is part of what they're doing. They're appealing to their Jewish pedigree, and Paul says, you want to talk Jew? I'll talk Jew with you. I'll talk in Hebrews, Abraham's descendants. I've got it all, okay? Now, of course, Paul didn't consider his Jewish pedigree to be significant in light of Christ. You can see that clearly in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 8, right? Paul talks about his Jewish pedigree, and he says, look, I, I consider all of this junk compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He didn't consider that as something that's significant in light of Christ, but he presents it here to remind the Corinthians that he's not inferior on that score if they're giving, putting stock in it. In other words, if these guys who are coming and touting their, their uh, heritage as the Old Testament people of God, if they're getting credence for that, traction for that, altitude for that, Paul says, well, I want you to know they got nothing on me. Okay, so we're going to start doing that. I want you to know right off they get nothing from, they, they have no advantage over me in that. Paul says, are they servants of Christ? But then he again feels compelled to say, I am speaking as being out of my mind. You know, how many times does he have to do this? I'm speaking as a fool. I'm speaking in foolishness. I'm out of my mind. You see how bothered he is to be put in this position where he has to make a case for himself. He thinks that it ought to be my life ought to testify to you. You are my children. I founded this church. You should be defending me. But you've put me in this position where I have to make a case for myself. And so he keeps reminding him that this is not something that he wants to do. He's doing it because his love for them compels him to do it. And he then answers this question, are they servants of Christ? He says, I am more of one. Okay, they servants of Christ, I'm more of one. Paul's asking whether these false apostles, he's asking, are they considered servants of Christ by the Corinthians? That's what he means when he says, are they servants of Christ? Do you judge them? Do you see them as servants of Christ? Which, of course, the Corinthians did. They saw them as servants of Christ. They had they brought them in, tolerated them, given them leadership positions so they could abuse and exploit them. So, yes, they saw them that way. Paul's not altering his assessment of them that he'd just given that, in fact, what are they? They're servants of Satan. That's who they really are. 
But he says, look, are they servants of Christ in your eyes? Is that how you perceive them? I got to tell you, I'm more of one. Okay, I'm more of one. He's more of a servant of Christ. Paul, you know, should go on to show in what ways he's a superior servant, right? He says, do you receive them as servants of Christ? I'm more of one than you'd expect him to lay out, you know, the triumphs of his ministry. As D.A. Carson notes, given that brag sheets were common in the Greco-Roman world. And it just strikes us as it was a different place, and that's largely because of the influence of Christianity. But these brag sheets, where we just sit here and talked about how wonderful we are, they were common in the Greco-Roman world. We might expect Paul to do what? To list his exploits and his victories. You see, that's what you'd be, you know, you want to go toe-to-toe, and we're going to say, listen to how wonderful and triumphant I am. We could imagine Paul saying something like this. I have established more churches... I've preached the gospel in more lands and to more ethnic groups. I've traveled more miles. I have won more converts. I have written more books. I have raised more money. I have dominated more councils. I have walked with God more fervently and seen more visions. I have commanded the greatest crowds and performed the most spectacular miracles. You can picture that, right? I mean, where the way you're following, you say, look, if Paul's going to come in and talk about he's a superior servant, that's how they're looking at Paul. You'd say, well, Paul, you come ahead and say this kind of stuff. But that's not what Paul says. Instead, what does he do? He details his sufferings, his loss, his shame, his defeats. So Paul's making a case for himself speaking as a fool and doing that, but even there he will not go and present to them the kind of worldly criteria that they use. He won't do it. It's as if the primary criterion of true apostleship is massive suffering in the service of Christ. That's what it looks like what Paul is putting out there. You see, something diametrically opposed to his opponent's system of values. That's not how they present it. They present it, look, the man of God, the apostle of God, he comes in, riding high, fat bankroll, rhetorical skills, status in the society, he's a professional man, he can do all this stuff, command people. And Paul talks about, I was beat all over the Mediterranean. And you just go, whoa, whoa. See, what is, what's going on here? See, enlisting these kinds of things in his brag sheet, it looks like Paul is not so subtly ridiculing or parodying the bragging of the false apostles as they come in and they say all these things. Well, Paul says, you want to talk? I got something for you. Listen to what I do. You who want to boast about those kinds of things. He says, with more labors. Okay, with more labors, probably reference to the manual labor while preaching the gospel. And that was something that the false teachers, they considered that degrading. Paul worked with his hands. And as I told you, the idea was that, no, a teacher in antiquity who would travel around, he would be supported. And that would be seen, as you see, he has, he's supported because he has something valuable to say. You see, so he gets money from that. He doesn't lower himself to working with his hands. And Paul sits here and says, you know, with more labors, he says, with more imprisonments. Not the kind of thing the false apostles would put very high on their resume, would they? Imprisonments? That's the society, the power structure coming against you and throwing you in prison. It is a rejection by the world instead of dominance of the world. And Paul says, more imprisonments, beatings beyond measure. Not more beatings than his opponents as though they'd been beaten. No, he says beatings beyond measure. And then he fleshes this out in verses 24 and 25. He says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. This is corporal punishment. Physical punishment that had been inflicted on Paul. The Jews out of Deuteronomy chapter 25 especially verse 3, they limited their corporal punishment, their beatings, to 40 blows. And actually, they would reduce one, so they didn't accidentally go over it. So they would, they would limit it. So they would, that's why he says the 40 minus 1, and we see that same terminology confirmed later in Jewish writing. So he says five times. They would whip somebody hard. The Mishnah says, with all your might. 
13 times on the chest, 26 times on the back. And I'm just looking. He says he went through this five times. How many times would it take to intimidate a person? So he says, if standing for Christ gets me this, I'm out. Five times. I just, I, it just, it's amazing. And see, this is, this is the power of God at work in his life. He says three times he was beaten with rods, and this refers to beatings by Romans. So where you had in Roman colonies, you basically had a, a fellow named a praetor, and he was, he was proceeded or preceded by le- lictors, they were called. Guys who had little sticks, batons they'd beat you with. And it was like a roving police force. And so if the praetor said, you know, the, these guys need straightening out, then the lictors would summarily beat them. Now, Paul theoretically would be exempt from that being a Roman citizen, but there's a number of of instances where we know that that rule was ignored. So Paul says three times he was beaten by Romans. Okay, why? Because what's he doing? He's out preaching. He's causing commotion and people don't like, you know, government entities never like commotion. Okay, so if they spot you and you're causing, you guys just shut up and do what we want you to do. He's causing commotion. What happens? We're beating this dude. So five times he has the 40 lashes minus one. Three times he's beaten with rods. He refers to frequent deaths, which is a general reference to many types of situations in which he faced mortal danger. I'm not talking about, you know, just some mortal danger that Paul says. He speaks of frequent deaths. He says, once I was stoned, no doubt referring to his horrifying experience in Lystra, In Acts chapter 14, verse 19, he says, Three times I was shipwrecked, one of which was far enough out that he spent a night and day in the sea, meaning in the the deep. Three times I was shipwrecked, one of them being far enough that he spends a night and day out there in the sea, perhaps clinging to, to wreckage until rescue arrives. I don't know about you. This is horrible stuff. Right? I mean, if we knew anybody who went through just one of these things, you'd be going, man, you were out there all night floating on wreckage? Yeah, and I was shipwrecked a number of other times, and he's going to be shipwrecked again in Acts chapter 27 when he goes to Rome. Right? You know the shipwreck there? So you look at what Paul put up with and what he endured. So he says that he's shipwrecked in his constant movement. He faced a multitude of dangers not the least of which was crossing rivers and being robbed. You know, we think about crossing rivers, no sweat, I'll drive my car over it. No problem. But apparently, crossing rivers wasn't that easy. And I guess it depended on where the river was and what stage it was in and all that kind of stuff. So there was danger involved in doing that, and there were dangers from from being robbed. People are people. You think that people didn't hang out and say, hey... Here's somebody who looks like a victim. I think I can take them. Come on, guys. Let's go take everything they have. And so here's Paul traveling all over the place. And so he says, I'm in danger of being robbed. He was persecuted by Jews. He was attacked by Gentiles. And he faced dangers in all types of places. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the country. Dangers at sea. And he says he was in danger from false brothers. Okay, danger from false brothers. This is, this is those who claim to be fellow Christians but are not. This is, you know, classic case are these Judaizers. Right, what do they do? They come and they say, no, 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 see, see, we really are, we're just superior Christians. We're just deeper Christians. We understand more. We are the people of God and we have it right and Paul's watering things down. Don't listen to Paul. You need to come on in and become a Jew. Then you'll be okay. You see, so he says in dangers, and they stirred up trouble against Paul everywhere. Why? Because they hated the fact that Paul said, "Uh uh-uh, you're not binding the Mosaic law. It has been rendered obsolete, and I will not let you go back and grab it as though it is still binding on people and enforce these Gentiles to submit to the Mosaic law. Well, they took that as an offense because they had misinterpreted the Mosaic Law, and earlier on in the class, that's why I spent a long time on that, talking about that. But that's how they were. He says he was in danger from false brothers. He says, I have lived with labor and toil, 
I've lived with labor and toil and many sleepless nights. You can just see that his ministry, his ministry was one of exhausting labor, pressure, and too much to do in too little time. You know, it's like, we because we, we, we think so much of Paul, you can get the, this idea that, you know, it was just great. You know, Paul was walking around, he was glowing, people were fanning him, going, he's an apostle. No, look at, look at his life. Look what he's telling us here. He, he went through all this kind of exhausting labor, facing all these pressures. It was scarcely, his life was scarcely characterized by luxury, comfort, and reflective ease, where he just sits back and... He was in a war. He was spreading the gospel and on the front line, and he was in a war. He says, I've lived with hunger and thirst, many fastings, cold and nakedness. Paul experienced hunger and thirst, probably associated with his awkward travel arrangements. I mean, the guy's going all over the place. So you can see him experiencing it there and probably flowing from an empty pocketbook. You see, that would be a terrible thing for these people. They say, listen, no, no, no. See, your wealth and power and status, that's a Paul. He says, listen, I'm going hungry and thirsty. I don't have anything. Cold and nakedness, insufficient clothing. You see, insufficient clothing, it might have been forced on him by prison life or by financial destitution. His stuff, he wasn't Gucci down. You see, but that's how it got to be. You know, you got you to be Gucci. You can't teach anybody, speak about Christ, unless you got the hair, you got the teeth, and you got the Gucci look. Now, how, what has happened to us? Huh? It's just insanity. But he's not that way. Paul's not that way. Here's what Carson says. He says, while the Corinthians were being taught that truly great teachers earned huge fees and commanded multiplying assets... The Apostle Paul frequently lived so far below the poverty line, he would have needed substantial sums to reach it. For this, he suffered doubly. The privations themselves, and then the condescending scorn of immature triumphalists who married pagan greed with overrealized eschatology to argue that financial prosperity was the reward of the just and the right sons of God, conveniently forgetting the cross. And we have this kind of stuff all the time now. You see, this idea that that's how it is. That's the mark that you're God's man, you see. I'm Gucci down in the, you know, I got the cathedral. And so you see, this is something that, that Paul is saying, listen, this is, and when you think of the context where he's putting these things forward, all of these guys are talking about those kinds of things, and he comes in and he says, look at how I have suffered. Look at how I have been scorned. And there's a reason, as Paul will explain and apart from the other things he could mention, he says daily he has the pressure of his concern for all the churches. Now, this isn't the self-centered worry that Jesus forbid in Matthew chapter 6, but it's a healthy concern for the participation of other people in the kingdom. It's more akin to Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. You see, it is that kind of connection, that kind of heart that wants people and Paul says, look, I have this thing going on where I have this concern for the churches when saints are weak, when they are abused, when they are exploited, when they are imprisoned, when they are lacking, when they are weak in the sense that Paul is weak, unlike the triumphalists who despise any kind of weakness, Paul empathizes with their weakness. You see, he says, look, who's weak? And I'm not weak. Who is suffering and I'm not suffering with them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And when they are being exploited and abused and imprisoned and doing without, I suffer with them. Unlike these guys who sit here and look at that and they say, that's a mark of, oh no, I have nothing to do with you. That's God's stink eye on you. You see? And so Paul says, listen, who's weak and I'm not weak? Who, who experiences that kind of thing? And when saints are led into sin, Paul burns with indignation against the behavior of those who caused it. What do you have going on in Corinth? You have people who are trying to pull them into sin, pull them away from their allegiance to Paul, lead them into this heresy. And Paul says, when this kind of thing, who is made to stumble and I don't burn? You see that? And, and I just wonder, you know, how do we feel about that? When people are being pulled into sin by the behavior of other people, do we, oh well, 
show up. You know, that's not how Paul was. And you, just, you get such insight into his heart, insight into his life. Now, Paul's parody of the self-praise that people wrote in their own honor, it culminates in these last verses, 30 to 33, where he refers to his escape from Damascus. That's reported in Acts chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. See, Paul's Christian life, it pretty much began not with him exercising rank and power in the society. That's not how his Christian life began, but with him being the target of those of rank and power in the society. See, powers that were allied to kill him. Here he comes. He's, you know, he's a star. He's a scholar. He's schooled under Gamaliel. He's rising above many of those of his own age. He's got everybody. He's on the fast track to success. He embraces Christ, and what happens? The world comes down on him. The world comes in. Right, he embraces Christ, and somebody's trying to kill him. So this is a clue. You see, this is a clue. So he talks about this. His, his, his life begins this way. And it was in that weak and vulnerable position that God delivered him through the disciples in Damascus. And he did so. He didn't deliver Paul by the glorious means of some kind of military heroics. You know, so he's like Batman and he jumps out. He wipes out everybody. Leaps over the wall. That's not how it happened. Could God have done that? Of course he could have. <laughs> sure he could have. But how did he have Paul escape? Hiding in a basket and being slipped down the wall. You see? Paul was in a position of weakness. Paul was in a position where he had nothing and the powers were all allied against him trying to kill him. And how does God exercise his power? He exercises his power in that weakness while Paul is lowered through that window, through that wall. There was nothing about it in which Paul could glory. It was God's power that rescued him in the midst of human weakness. And th that lesson never left Paul. And that's what he's talking about here when he says, listen to how I've been treated and how I've suffered in the name of Christ. And you got these people talking about, you know, well, we really have great rhetoric, and you know, we're on the top of the world and in the catbird seat, and we're people of status and power, and we're the people who deserve your respect because of those things. And Paul says, in essence, the mark of an apostle is massive suffering in the name of Jesus. You see, so that's what he goes ahead. Let's go to chapter 12. He says, it is necessary to boast, though it is not beneficial. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ that 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or outside the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Indeed, I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body I do not know, God knows, that he was caught up into the paradise and heard unutterable words, which it is not permitted a man to speak. I will boast on behalf of such a man. But I will not boast on behalf of myself, except in my weaknesses. For should I wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone credits to me beyond what he sees in me or hears from me, particularly because of the excellency of the revelations. Therefore, lest I be overly exalted, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that he should batter me, lest I be overly exalted. Regarding this, I three times appealed to the Lord that it might depart from me. Yet he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will instead boast most gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might reside with me. Therefore, because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am powerful. All right, Paul says here in, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 10, see these false apostles, they claim superiority. They're, they're trying to get an edge against Paul in the Corinthian congregation, not only by appealing to such things as rhetoric, you know, that we are superior in how we arrange the arguments and all of our education about formal rhetoric, 
They not only appeal to that, they not only appeal to their ability to command fees as teachers, not only appeal to their leadership style, but, you know, we know how to get on top of people and, you know, push them and boss them. So they appeal to all of these things as though these are the marks of a man of God. But they also appear, appeal to spiritual superiority. You see, they enhance their standing by bragging about the visions and the revelations that they claim to have received from God. And so this is one of the things that they're doing, whereas Paul is reluctant to talk about those things. They come in and start talking, oh, you know, let me tell you, you know, you know, I just, it was just grand, I had all this, God was doing this for me and all that. And Paul just doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to come in and, and for a number of reasons, but he doesn't want to do that. But Paul, again, here, he notes that boasting is not beneficial, okay, meaning, I think, in one sense, under normal circumstances. But this isn't a normal circumstance. This is a circumstance when it's necessary to do it to protect the Corinthians. But he says, boasting is not beneficial, but because of this situation, he then goes on to speak about visions and revelations. Okay, but he finds this so embarrassing to do that he can only bring himself to speak of it in third person. He has to distance himself from it. It is too excruciating for him to come out and say, let me tell you what happened to me. I was taken to the third heaven. I saw stuff none of these clowns have seen. He puts it in the third person and says, I know a man. Okay, I know a man. But he lets the cat out of the bag. Okay, but he, he does that, and it's, it's that painful for him. Now, Paul may be saying, when he says that boasting is not beneficial, he may be saying that boasting about vision and revelations is not beneficial in the sense that unverifiable claims like that, where I say, I was taken up, I had this strength, that, that's no basis for one's reputation. It may be not be beneficial in terms of you assigning that. Paul wants to be judged on how he lived and conducted himself. Not to have somebody come in and say, oh yeah, this subjective experience, I had this thing. And so he may be talking about that. But he says that 14 years before, he was caught up or transported to the third heaven, which in chapter 12, verse 4, he refers to as paradise. Okay, Paul had a visionary experience. Does that surprise us? I mean, Paul speaks about, you know, I was in a trance. Okay, Paul winds up going up, he has a visionary experience, and this reference to the third heaven is, is in line with Jewish understandings of levels of heaven. They had different ideas. You had some speak of three, five, ten. So Paul is apparently using a, a three-level division where you have the atmospheric heaven where birds fly and that kind of thing. Then you have the stellar heaven, the firmament, and then you have the spiritual heaven, the unlimited heaven the abode of God, and that's where Paul went. Paul was taken right in. And he says here, this was so real, I can't tell you whether I actually went there physically or I just went there in a vision. But from my standpoint, I was there. But he says twice, whether in the body or out, I don't know. I can't tell you. I can tell you I was there. I was given this vision. And so Paul says, yes, this happened. I went up there. I had this. And the vision was such that Paul, he's not sure, as I said, whether he was up there in body or just in spirit. And during this extraordinary vision, he heard things that were inexpressible, inutterable. He heard these things and that they could only be described to those with a similar experience. That's what he means, inutterable how. They could only be described to somebody who has a similar experience. Something like trying to decide, describe sight to somebody who had been born blind. How, how would you do it? We have, no, we have no connection where I can describe this to this experience. So inutterable in that sense. And Paul wasn't permitted to reveal what he heard by using analogies and metaphorical language. He wasn't even permitted to take a shot at it that way because these things were given to Paul not to pass on to the church but for his own special benefit, his own spiritual benefit. God had called Paul to something. He called Paul to something serious. And when you look and you say, look at what this guy endured. Do you see the depth of his faith that God had reinforced for him and said, come here, you're going to suffer. 
You're going to take, but Paul, I want you to see the truth so that nothing will shake it from you. No rod, no lash, no shipwreck, no hatred, no dangers. You just hold on to this like a mad dog because I've shown you it's the truth. And I think this was a great benefit to Paul. And Paul goes on and just is, to me, he's just breathtaking in the kind of person that this Paul is. And we wonder, you know, well, how did Christianity explode? Why does Christianity seem to, well, look at this guy. Look at many of these people. This was their life. This was the message. It was God's revolution, and they were just preaching it, telling it, wouldn't be silenced. You see, and so what happened? Some people come, some people don't. The aroma of death to some, the aroma of life to others. But you couldn't shut them up. And it was, it was something, but we're just so used to it. It's just so common. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I've been going to church all my life. Uh, you see? There's something about the, the excitement of what is God doing that they were out there saying, whoa, there's something happening, something going on here. Now, when he, when he views this experience objectively, when he looks at it in the third person, he admits that it's an extraordinary blessing of God, which would justify boasting. Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> Look at it, okay? But from a subjective perspective, when he writes in first person, he can only boast of his weaknesses. And he adds, however, that, that if he did make such a claim, and if he did boast about that, his claim wouldn't be foolishness, but would be true. Wouldn't be, it would be, not be foolishness in that sense. It would be true if he said it. Because he sure enough had it happen. Okay, so he lets the cat out of the bag here. He was indeed, you see, he was the one who had this experience. You see, he lets the cat out of the bag. Definitely, he was the one who had it. And the reason he refrains from such direct boasting, why he distances himself from this, he does it about his visionary experience, which he could do it if he chose to do it. But he puts distance between himself and this thing is that he fears others will give it undue importance. That's what he's worried about here. If I go on and say this kind of, he doesn't want his converts to assess him in verses 6 and 7. He doesn't want them to assess him on the basis of some private and unverifiable experience. But on what? On the basis of his behavior. On the basis of his conduct that can be seen and known by all people. Because if he says these things, somebody else can come in and say, oh, Paul? Yeah, by the way, I was there waiting for Paul when he got there. You see? I greeted Paul when he got there. So he didn't want that. He doesn't want to be judged on that. So he's concerned about saying these kinds of things because people will latch onto that and make that the basis. Paul says, you judge it on the basis of how I conducted myself. I planted that church, suffered for that church, cried for that church, have done everything, every ounce of me to bless that church. You judge me on that. These people are trying to tear you down. I heard that bell. Thanks. Thanks. 